This is Sarah, and I just want to take a moment to speak to you about this week's sponsor, Favor. Favor Inc. is a statewide family led nonprofit 501c3 organization that is committed to empowering families as advocates and partners in improving educational and health outcomes for our children. Favor is the Connecticut State Organization of the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Favor offers a single place for families with children who have medical, mental, emotional, and behavioral health challenges to find information, assistance, and training. To find out more about Favor, please go to favor-ct.org. We are grateful for our opportunity to work with Favor as a sponsor, and now on to the rest of the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Chronicles. My name is Sarah, and today I have very special guests, Dr. and Dr. Elton and Laquita Higgs. They are authors and adoptive parents. They are the authors of the book Shattered Dreams But Hope. They are caregivers for their two daughters with Huntington's disease. Hello, Mr. and Miss, or Dr. and Dr. Higgs. How are you today? Oh, well, you you can drop the title. (laughs) Hello. Glad to be with you, Sarah. Thank you. I'm very glad to have you guys here. Um, I have started reading your book, and it's just it's just a really incredible journey that you guys have been on, and a really really um, difficult one, I would say. But would you guys like to further introduce yourself? Well, um, Laquita and I have been um, married for. 63 years <laughs> a <And> long time <laughs> a lot of water under that bridge um, we grew up in texas both of us met at in college and got married while we were still in college there in texas um, moved away from texas uh, first of all to uh, do graduate work and and then my first teaching job was at University of Michigan Dearborn in Michigan, of course, and uh, I spent 36 years there. Laquita, while we were um, in that stage of our life, after the kids uh, got into school, she went back for her graduate work and uh, she finished a, a doctor's degree in history and English history. Mine is in English literature. So we've uh, shared together uh, in our intellectual pursuits as well as uh, uh, raising three adopted children. And uh, I retired, goodness, over 20 years ago now. Uh, And uh, as, as did Laquita, so we uh, now live in Jackson, Michigan, um, where our oldest daughter, who is not affected by HD, uh, lives, and uh, we're happy to be close to her. Our youngest, uh, Rachel, uh, who has HD, Huntington's disease, uh, is in an adult foster home, a foster home here in the Jackson area and uh, so we still are in a very regular contact with her and uh, are her legal guardians and therefore uh, take responsibility for making sure that she's cared for. That pretty well covers it but I would add that one of the most important schools we've been in has been as a caregiver. It's a hard school but it's been, it's shaped our lives so much and our characters. So we're thankful for that. Well, thank you guys for that. Um, thank you for that introduction. And I agree the the life experience of a caregiver, there's no education that, <laughs> Quite can, like it. <laughs> that can compare to actual real life experience of being responsible for another person. It's pretty, pretty big. Um, so would you guys like to tell us more about your family? Well, I'll let Laquita take that. Well, we we uh, ad- adopted the three daughters. Uh, the first, uh, first one was just a, a wonderful little child. And at the time we said, oh, we want another one. And uh, 
we're, we're people of faith. So we had said, well, let's, let's, we should, we should do something good and get a, a handicapped child. And the agency presented us with this child who had no physical handicaps, but was at risk for Huntington's disease. And we looked it up and didn't find much because there wasn't much about it at the time. Uh, it's ch that's changed. And that was 66, wasn't it? Uh, yes, yes, 67. And um, anyway, we, we prayed about it, though. I first I said, I can't. They said, mentioned something about personality disorder. And I thought, no way. I don't want a part of that. But um, we prayed about it. We felt very strongly that the good Lord wanted us to adopt that child. And uh, so we did. And, and that that made such a difference later on when things got really hard because we could look back and say, this is what we're supposed to be doing. So that's about it. We now have, uh, by our oldest daughter, the one not affected by Huntington's, she has three children, grown children now. And uh, so we enjoy interacting with them. We see them regularly. Uh, at church, you nowhere else on Sundays since we go to the same congregation. But often we uh, get together in between as well. And Perhaps I, we should mention, too, that the third adopted daughter is the biological daughter of the second adopted daughter. So it's sort of a complicated family situation, but uh, it's, it's, been, it's been good. Not quite like the old songs, I'm my own grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Similar uh, ambiguities. Yes. <laughs> um, no, and that's in. So, do you want to talk about why you adopted your daughter's daughter? Do you want to share that? Oh, right. Yes. Well, okay. Cynthia already had, uh, was unable to care for herself. Uh, we had had to bring her home uh, to live with us. We tried to set her up uh, independently, but she couldn't. And so we brought her home, and shortly after, she told us she was pregnant. Um, and so we we first said, well, we think you should adopt the baby out, and she refused. So we said, well, then we want to adopt her. But we wanted adoption because we knew we needed to be have that, that authority. Um, which was good. It was necessary. And she readily, uh, Cynthia readily agreed to that adoption. The father had waived his, he was glad to waive his responsibilities. Uh, and so that's why we handled it that way. She was just unable to care for them. So we had primary responsibility for her from birth. From birth. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and clarifying that for my audience. Um, I, I appreciate that. So do you want to tell us exactly what Huntington's disease is? It's been described in a kind of sort of thumbnail way as a combination of Alzheimer's, uh, Gary, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and Parkinson's, Parkinson's. all at once, <laughs> Yeah, all in the same person at once, because it, it, in common with those is a neurologically degenerative disease that is it actually uh, works to destroy cells in the brain and that has consequences in Huntington's disease it has both psychological and therefore behavioral consequences and physical consequences and, and cognitive too the thinking is slowed and uh, there's not the ability to reason judgment is poor. Uh, there's no cure. Uh, there is some medication that will help with the involuntary movements, which <clears throat> are quite bad at, uh, after it's gone on a while. Uh, but our, our neurologist at the University of Michigan uh, says that the side effects are so uh, terrible that he doesn't recommend that. So we, she only takes some psychotropic medication for her um, her behavioral and, and mental problems. She's had yeah. some hallucinations, and so she needed that. Yeah, and, I and the, the, the disease is uh, 
progressive and irreversible. And uh, the uh, the final death usually is a, a sort of spinoff from uh, from Huntington's. Huntington's, of course, over time weakens the body, and so uh, people fall prey to pneumonia, for example. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. it's genetic, um, and it's a dominant gene. So if one inherits that, it's a mutant gene. Um, we all have the Huntington gene in our bodies, but uh, some there are some mutant genes that are passed on. If you have one of those, then you're going to get it because it's dominant. There is also a distinction between uh, the usual development of Huntington's in middle age and juvenile Huntington's degree Huntington's disease. And juvenile Huntington's disease can develop in the early childhood. Uh, in our two, it developed in the teen years. Wow. Thank you guys so much for that. And can you talk about how rare or common hunting, Huntington's disease is? It's been said that, that they used to say this year, some years ago, actually, that there are at least about 30,000 in the U.S. with it. it. It's found all over the world, actually. Uh, actually started in England, so far as we know. Uh, but uh, I think there probably are more than that now because it just seems more more people. But uh, it's, yeah, anything else? Yeah, um, less than 10% of the... Have juvenile form, yeah. which is unfortunate. That yeah. Rachel had to have that. Um, so that's that's hard. Do you mind telling my audience about juvenile Huntington's and how that differs from on adult onset Huntington's? Yeah. It's caused by the greater number of these repeats of this variant gene. Uh, and it's, it's, it comes, so it comes earlier, of course, often if very young children causes a stiffness and they die early. Uh, it moves faster in the person who has it than if you develop it later on. Normally, Huntington's doesn't really start until uh, early 40s, that sort of thing. Sometimes even later, depending upon the number of these variant genes that you have. Um, the the, the uh, defective gene has an excess of a certain kind of protein. And the more of that protein it has, the higher the score, so to speak. Uh, of the repeats within the gene. It's kind of complex. But, but uh, it, to put it on a, on a scale, uh, the count of uh, 40 or more is usually the uh, threshold of uh, it's developing into the symptoms. So the larger the number right. of those repeats, the sooner you have it. Rachel had 59 repeats. So, But we've known of people who have it up into the 70s and so on. Wow. They, they start even earlier and it moves faster. And it's complicated in juvenile HD with all of the uh, complications of uh, the teenage years, puberty, and uh, sexual development and so on. Uh, there are behavioral problems that are exacerbated by the presence of Huntington's. And of course, in those years, the hormones are raging. So there's often the hypersexuality, which presents some real problems. So just as Rachel was born to uh, a mother who who didn't have a responsible mate. Uh, so she uh, mothered a child, which has been adopted by friends of ours. Mm-hmm. He's, he's eight years old now. So uh, that's, that's a, a, a very common manifestation of, of the uh, juvenile HD. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing all that. Can you share some of the early symptoms of HD? It's a behavior. Uh, and of course, when it's when they're young, as, as Rachel and Cynthia were, you just think it's normal uh, teen behavior. Uh, but these 
for instance, Rachel just um, escaped, <laughs> ran away one time through the window. She was due to start her senior year in, in the school we had her in, a Christian school, and she just ran off. We, <laughs> it was very difficult, very puzzling. We had to put her in another school. She refused to go back to the one. <clears throat> just things like that happened. Uh, and we noticed uh, movements that we knew in, in Rachel, we knew by our experience already with HD, we knew that they were indicative of the fact that she very probably had the gene. And, yeah. By the time we saw the physical difficulties, we, we were quite certain. It was another year before it was officially diagnosed. Yeah. The protocol now is that they will not diagnose anyone until they're consenting adults at age 18. Um, so they, uh, in, in distinction from other neurological diseases, the defective gene has been identified yes. and therefore research can be much more focused for that than uh, say Alzheimer's or uh, Parkinson's. Uh, so if you want to talk about it as an advantage, although not, it hasn't produced anything yet that's an effective yeah. treatment, there's more potential. Yes, because... a lot of research going on. So that's the end clinical trials. One very promising trial just failed. Though, but So uh, it's just going to take a while. Yeah, it sounds like, it sounds like there's a lot of um, just complicated stuff with you know, obviously genetic, genetic disorders, genetic, um, diseases can be really complicated for, yes, yes. for people to understand. And, you know, unfortunately, like, well, actually I want to say, fortunately, you guys were aware that Rachel's mother, Cynthia, and her grandmother had Huntington's disease. So you guys were pretty, I mean, I think, would you say that you were pretty confident like looking at the signs and the behaviors versus a family maybe that doesn't have a family oh, history that's, that's, of this. That's, that's terrible when a family gets taken by surprise these symptoms start showing up and they don't know where they came from they don't know a family history um we're a part of a uh, an online uh support group for families with juvenile HD um, and uh, one of the part one of the members of that group uh, her she now is having to deal with a husband and a son who are symptomatic uh, symptomatic and uh, a terrible shock you know because she was she was totally unprepared and uh, so yeah, if if you're not aware of the family history, you might know that uh, Granny Simpkins was a strange person and finally died in an institution. But, but they didn't know what it was yeah. back then, and so yeah, we've met several people like that. And by the time they they had it, they already had children. And of course, whether to have children or not, if you're a patient, is a big decision. Yeah, you don't want to pass it on, or you have to decide about the and, risk. And it sounds like it's almost certain to be passed on, or it's a high probability. It doesn't skip generations. Uh, if 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 some if one person in a couple has the gene, then there's the possibility of passing it on to their progeny. Yeah, and I can imagine that that must be really difficult for families who, yeah. yes. you know, are aware and, yes. and things like that. A lot of genetic counseling is necessary for people to cope with that. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So at the time you adopted Cynthia, um, you had very little services and resources for Huntington's mm. disease. But as you said, that was in the 60s. In the, the late 60s. 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the 1960s. So, like, the internet did not exist. No. <laughs> <laughs> the port groups were probably not easy to come by. Right. Um, overall resources were difficult. And then by the time, so from that time to 
Rachel's diagnosis, how have those services get? Do you feel like the services got better? In, yes, in that there's, time there's much more awareness, more public awareness about the disease. Actually, at the time, though, we did learn of a support group in Toledo, Ohio, and so we drove that to that every month. We lived in Dearborn, Michigan at the so time. It was a little drive, but uh, th- but that that's where we really learned what it was. That's the first time we saw anybody who had it, whose physical symptoms were were pretty advanced, and so that was quite an education. Yeah, uh, but, but there is a, a national society called Huntington's Disease Society of America, very active. They produce a lot of materials that are very helpful. They even produce a booklet you can give to to doctors, and that's been very helpful to our family physician and so on. Uh, so so there's a lot now lot of information. When we uh, first realized that uh, Cynthia had Huntington's, she was about 25 when she She was was 25 25 Mm -hmm. when she was diagnosed. And they had to diagnose her uh, on just on the basis of family history and and observation. observation. Mm -hmm. Very soon after that, uh, the the gene was was isolated. And uh, they were able to uh, quickly develop a blood test. That was in 93 that Mm -hmm. she was diagnosed. So uh, with the blood test, uh, then the guesswork is taken out because it will tell you what this protein repeat is and whether or not it's high enough for the disease to be predictably developed. But uh, social services have uh, have increased. The national organization has successfully uh, set up various programs. Uh, they now have what they call centers of excellence. And these are medical centers uh, usually connected with a university medical service and, and a research program. Uh, those are scattered throughout the country and people with Huntington's disease can uh, get in touch with them and get coordinated unified services. There's still a a shortage of qualified physicians, the primary care physicians who are aware of uh, Huntington's and can give the general direction and it can also facilitate the acquiring of social services, say, and um, home care services and so on. But yes, since that time, uh, things have been better. Uh, I spent a whole summer trying to figure out the where we could get help caring for Cynthia. Yeah, we were getting desperate. She, the, the behavior was had even become violent at times and uh, we had the baby by then. And so it was very difficult, but yeah. And you it didn't get any help. <laughs> it, she no, fell between the cracks. No know? social agency would admit, well, this is in our purview. Uh, yeah. It was uh, developmental in one sense, but it developed late. Um, it was uh, behavioral and therefore psychological, but it was a result of a physical disability. So <laughs> got all mixed up. So um, just to follow up on that, though, I so services have gotten significantly better over the years for people with Huntington's disease and their families. Do you think there's still like services that are lacking or services that could be improved? Yes. Uh, in spite of the fact that you have these centers of excellence you have in uh, many states, you, you will have a, rep, a state organization, uh, sub-organization of Huntington's disease. Uh, but in, in particular localities, you may or may not be able to plug in to the system. Unfortunately, the uh, administration of social services is not uh, usually centralized enough for you to be able to go to the state 
uh, agency and say, okay, uh, we, we need these resources in this particular locality. Uh, the, the regional social service authorities function on their own and, and uh, what works in one region is not necessarily going to be operative yeah, in so another. It can be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still a lack of services and um, yeah. hopefully, you know, what you guys are doing, you guys are bringing more awareness and advocacy yes. to Washington's disease. So hopefully this, this helps the next generation. Yes, generation. and by the time we had Cynthia to, I mean, Rachel, the younger one to care for, we knew to get a team in place. We needed a psychiatrist, of course, our primary care physician. We needed a neurologist. What else? Psychological counseling. Yeah, and so we knew to, to get that in order to get guardianship because we had to do that. Yeah, too. it's very important to uh, get the legal help that you need to gain the uh, ability to really make the decisions in caring for the for the person yeah. and uh, for the person to have uh, resources you need uh, a declaration of social security disability mm -hmm. and that takes some legal maneuvering as well yes um, disability services can be hard to come by for anybody <laughs> I think I think we can all agree that that's a little bit of a battle. It's you know, it's it's a little frustrating for families who are going through that process, and you know, especially like you said, you guys had some, you guys had some notion that this was a possibility with Rachel because of what you went through with Cynthia, and right. um, for families who are just discovering this and it's so new, I can imagine that all of this has got to be so so difficult to navigate Over, overwhelming yeah oh absolutely because i can imagine it was especially with such a lack of resources with cynthia when she was a young adult and diagnosed with this um i can only imagine the next question i have um now cynthia had passed away in 2010 right she had huntington's she was diagnosed with huntington's for 17 25. years mm -hmm. is that an average if you don't mind me asking is that an average prognosis if if you're talking about huntington's developed in middle age the average for that is about 16 years after becoming mm -hmm. symptomatic uh this period tends to be shorter for those who develop it in the juvenile form when when rachel was diagnosed she first thing she asked the doctor who told her she said how long do i have and he said oh 10 years or so well she's passed that mark and we're very thankful for that that she's she's managing to keep on uh, but who knows so. uh, as you point out it was 17 years for, for cynthia. Uh, cynthia and um uh, who knows, it may be so for Rachel, but uh, when you get to the point of, well, uh, Cynthia was in hospice care for two and a half months mm -hmm. before she finally passed away. And those were bad times. Uh, to, to see that deterioration is not uh, a happy thing. But uh, you have to be realistic. Yeah. And, uh, in a sense, that's the price of surviving that long, yeah. is that the quality of life decreases. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you do, and you know, sometimes, I know in your book you talked about kind of meeting the person where they're at, in a sense of, not so much in those words, but in a sense of um, – not putting too much expectations on someone with Huntington's disease, letting them kind of live their life happily. Um, you guys are both very well-educated people. And for your daughters to continue with a doctorate's degree, I'm sure that in initial adoption, that was probably a hope of yours that, you know, someday your daughter would have this in, but to just celebrate where they're at and what they can yeah. do that. Yeah. I felt like um, when I read that part of the book, I, that really struck a chord with me. While autism is not as 
it's nowhere near what you guys are going th or have gone through and are going through as parents. Just that reminder of to sometimes just lower expectations and just meet people where they're at and celebrate, I think is just such a good thing. Um, and I, I admire you guys for that advice because so many families forget. They just forget. They want to see their kids do all these things and they're like, well, let's push them to do these things. And, you know, in that 17 years your child has left or 10 years or whatever it may be, sometimes just being happy is more important. So I just, I just admired that in the book. And that's the message I got out of that part. Um, well, and, and we're glad you got that message because we did want that to come across that uh, you, it, you make a decision. Am I going to emphasize what's been lost? Am I going to emphasize what still remains? Yeah, as a caregiver, I think that the hardest thing for me was uh, that I still made the mistake of trying to teach her um, to do so and so, and and to uh, I finally had to realize she couldn't. Um, I was expecting too much from her. I just needed to love her and and uh, accept her as she was, as yeah. what she had become, and not keep trying to teach her to be something else than I thought she ought to be. That yeah. I, I made that was a big mistake I made with Cynthia. In, my expectations in, of hers. And in your book you address that, you know, we weren't perfect. We're just we're parents. And that's actually one of my favorite me quotes to quote myself because it's the <laughs> smartest thing I've ever said. We're not perfect, we're parents. Oh yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> we're merely parents. <laughs> it's it's uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's the truth though. Like we make mistakes as parents and how much does this affect our child? And it's so different when your child has some kind of special need or different need or disability or different ability um, to know the extent of how your decisions affect them. But the fact that you recognize it, I just, I just want to say like, I think that you guys are incredible. And I think that you guys have done everything you could for your daughters. And, um, you know, I just, I, I just, I appreciated your book a lot. So I just, I just want to share that. Um, so my next question, I, I actually want to talk more about the book. Obviously, you know, your daughters and what you've gone through as caregivers is your inspiration for the book. But what do you hope that the readers get out of it? Uh, I'll let Laquita answer that because I need to observe about the book that she's the principal author. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she, it was her idea. She drafted it, and I went along for the ride and offered suggestions here and there. Well, uh, yes, I. we made so many mistakes, but we did feel like we learned some strategies to help, and I so wished I had known those from the beginning. And so I, I just, we just wanted to be of help to somebody. Uh, and so we wrote about our experience and it was, uh, it, yeah, I just, I just, I, I, it does help to know uh, that other people have gone through some tough stuff. And uh, sometimes we've gone to the national meetings and it's, you connect immediately with the people because they, they know what you're talking about. They've been through the, some of the same stuff, and it just helps, I think, for other people to know that you're not alone here, and you'll make mistakes, as you said, you're just parents. But, but there's there are some strategies that that you can do. You can uh, show your love in whatever way. Sometimes it's just keeping your mouth shut. Sometimes it's trying to redirect their. Uh, their behavior to something else, something better, uh, various things you can do and just mainly show them they, you understand that they are going through a lot too. I think it's lot just taking the, the picture off of yourself and start looking and thinking of how, what they're going through. Because as a caregiver, sometimes you can get so tired and feel unappreciated that, that you start feeling sorry for yourself and it's good just to keep remembering that they are going through some maybe 
much worse times than you are and yeah. to have that compassion. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. And and again, I, I do feel like this book provides a type of respite for families um, who would be going through it. I know, again, I'm not going through Huntington's with my kiddos, but there were there were parts of it that I really could relate to as as a mom of a child, you know, who's profound on the autism spectrum. And some of that advice could be used across the board in caregiver situations. Well, that's, that's uh, I think, in the subtitles of the book. Uh, uh, I don't know. What is it? I mean. Yes, after, after the book was published, we were told by some readers that uh, – that it would be good in other caregiving situations. We hadn't even yeah. really thought of that. So um, the subtitle is Encouragement for Caregivers of Huntington's Disease and Other Progressive Illnesses. Yeah, that was added. <laughs> yes, and I and I would agree with that as, you know, as a mom. Um, so how has writing about your family helped with just help you come to terms with some of the challenges that you faced. Oh yes, it was very therapeutic, very much so. Just to to write and, and cry a little. And anyway, it was good. It, it was. Uh, it helped us to review what we had been through. Uh, and you know, when you when you have to write it down, you have to organize it in some way in your mind. And uh, I don't think we had really done that. In fact, the g- genesis of, Ray, of Laquita's undertaking the writing was uh, the placement of Rachel in a home <laughs> so that she was no longer there 24-7. And Laquita felt that the f- first thing she needed to do was to write this down while it was still fresh in her mind. And uh, well, yes, and I had kept a journal, uh, which I wrote at least once a week, usually more about uh, what happened, like everything that happened. And we found that journal to be extremely helpful <clears throat> as we dealt with social services and filled out forms here and there. Uh, you look back and you find those things. And and so I would recommend that if, if you're any parent is at all inclined to write a little bit uh, to, to just keep some record of what goes on uh, occasionally anyway. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Elton, you have your poems. Yes. In the book as well. <laughs> you that, talk, when did you start for... writing poetry? <laughs> I beg your pardon, what is that? When did you start writing poetry? When I was in high school. Nice. Um, and, and your poems are about your daughters in the book. Well, I have some poems about my daughter. I, and it's it's wonderful. Rachel loves going back and reading the poems about her. This is called Probing Eyes, Poems of a Lifetime. But uh, yeah, there, there are a number of poems in that uh, collection about family and relationships uh, within the family. Uh, oh, the largest section of the poems has to do with what I call scriptural interpretations or applications, uh, which take biblical circumstances and uh, sort of make a poetic commentary on them. But uh, yes, as you say, in the back of the uh, uh, caregiving book uh, are a few that were written concerning uh, Cynthia and Rachel and our interaction with them. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your other book. So, so your faith, your family's faith has also been a big part and a driving force in your book and in, in how, in your approach to just caregiving. Would you guys like to talk about that a little bit? Well, ca- caregiving is such a hard job, or at least we found it. So it's really, it's really challenging and trying and, and and sometimes you feel, or we did, we felt so baffled. What do we do with this latest problem? <laughs> Another problem, what do we do? And we, we began to, to learn. It took a while to learn, but we thought, well, let's just pray and stop and not out loud usually, but just pray about it and get 
divine help if if he's willing and so that helped a lot it really did and maybe it did nothing more but just calm you and slow you down but it it was a great help well you know philosophically speaking one of the big questions that uh, people who are either already uh, people of faith or they're considering it or they're objecting to it um, is what's often referred to as the problem of evil. Uh, if God is good and powerful, then why do all these bad things take place? And when you're exposed to something, uh, you know, a serious illness that requires caregiving, somehow or another, you've got to come to terms with this uh, in order to keep from being embittered why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? And to the child. Uh, yeah. To the person. There has to be a larger meaning to the whole business. And uh, it, it makes a tremendous difference in your ability to carry on if you feel that there's a, a higher and a larger purpose being worked out through all of this evil that you're encountering. Uh, there's no mitigating the evil of uh, Huntington's or cancer or autism. Uh, it's bad stuff. Uh, and and you, you have to deal with it uh, in some effective way without just going under. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I, um, I personally am not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person and I believe that we go through things, to in and, and I I feel like we're kind of feeling the same way on this. We go through things, you know, God, the divine, the world, whatever it is we believe puts us through a set of circumstances so we can try to come out the other side as better people and learn something from it. I have people of all different faiths and backgrounds on this podcast and mm-hmm. and they will all say I went through it because it put me where I needed to be and um you know, it puts you guys on a path of, it's it's clear to me that your journey puts you guys on a path of, to advocacy to make the world a better place for families who are struggling with this right now, um, to to bring more awareness, to to teach parents forgiveness of themselves with, with Huntington's um, who are going through so much stuff. But I really believe in what you're saying, you know, as we're all put on a path and it's hard. And there's bad stuff and there's always bad stuff and it's how we come out the other side. And, you know, it's using our faith, our beliefs, whatever it is that we have in ourselves, in God, whatever, to overcome. And I think that that's beautiful. I really, I really think that that is a beautiful, universal message. It doesn't matter if you are faithful or not. You can take that message Mm -hmm. and apply it to your life, I hope. Well, I think a lot of people, I mean, part of a, part of ordinary life experience, uh, earlier when we were getting acquainted with each other, you were talking about marriage and what constitutes an effective marriage. When you get married, you don't know what you're getting into. Uh, you are led into it because of an emotional commitment to another person. But uh, as somebody told us when we were, uh, about to get married, he said, if you knew everything was going to happen in the next <laughs> 40 years, you wouldn't do this. <laughs> and we we all get consequences of our actions and, and our choices that we don't anticipate. And uh, th- there's not, there's no more injustice in that than there is in being here in the first place. So uh, I think that is a, uh, if we've discovered over the years and we would share with other people, just assume that you're going to encounter the unexpected and some of that unexpected is going to be unpleasant. Yep. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I, w- I was fortunate to live with my husband for like six years, five, five years before we got married. So, you know, I mostly knew it was like we got married and my mother-in-law was like, nothing's changed with you two, huh? You're still, it didn't feel different. But I know, I know what you're saying. Like, like living with him, having children with him, going through all the things. There are things that came up that were unexpected. 
we that's just but that's kind of the beauty of life too in a way is the unexpected and the changes and the growth so I just I really I just really appreciate like like that sentiment um I, I, I should say something of the Quita as has often said uh just about adopting children uh she said you know if we had not adopted children we would be insufferably smug <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no i i agree i think that if i never had my kids i wouldn't understand yeah what it's like to have kids with in in you know adopt adoption you're a valid to me anyway you're you're a valid parent if if you're an adopted parent um you're going through the ups and downs of raising that child, whatever they may be. Right. You're just as much a mom as a C-section mom or a, a vaginal birth mom. I, I don't like it when I hear parents judge other parents for the way they became parents. That's so not fair. Yeah. Because, right. because <laughs> you're just, of course. <laughs> we're all parents, you know? So I want to ask, how is Rachel doing now? She, she's she's in a very good home. We we had her home with us for many months when the pandemic was so bad. And that was a good, good experience, although it made us realize that we couldn't sustain that at our age. Uh, uh, but it was beautiful to have her. And and she really likes her, her new home that she has. And and we have a far better relationship. We have a wonderful relationship with her now. Whereas when she was living with us, we were the mean parents, uh, putting restrictions on her, watching her and all of that. And uh, so it, it's, it's been good. And, and she's on the whole doing well. She does follow quite a bit now. And so a wheelchair is in her future. She has a, a rollator, a, a walker uh, that helps her when she goes out she doesn't use it in the house Uh, she has a communication device because her speech is very hard to understand and so she has a lot of helps and uh, is doing well she Mm. has her moments still behavioral the staff will say oh she didn't do so and so but uh, she gets over it and quickly we uh, try to encourage whatever activities Rachel can still be involved in. Uh, she likes coloring and uh, will will show us proudly coloring that she's done. Uh, she likes crafts and uh, although she has, has to be helped with those. Nevertheless, she still participates in them. And amazingly enough, uh, she likes to write stories. And so she's still able to uh, type things out on her uh, laptop computer. And so uh, we're in the process of printing up one of her stories so she can have a hard copy there, you know, in front of her and show off to people. We don't allow her to go on the Internet. Uh, and so her computer's disabled for that uh, because that proved to be dangerous for her. She was... She she can't exert the kind of judgment that one needs in order to deal with the internet yeah. and all its possibilities. So. Yeah, and, and the internet can definitely be a dangerous place um, for, you yeah. know, people who don't have good judgment or children, people who just aren't wise yeah. enough yeah. to the world yet. It was um, dangerous it, for her, yeah. Yeah, it can absolutely be dangerous. Um, so I, you know, I applaud you guys for taking that kind of responsibility as well. And I also applaud you guys for getting her an AAC device, giving her something that she can use to communicate with on because a lot of families just don't understand that and that technology and can be difficult for families to learn as I still struggle to learn with my son's AAC device and I'm pretty tech savvy, um, but I still, I still struggle with that. So I appreciate you guys for taking that jump um i don't know if that was out of your comfort zone or not but um i i applaud you for that well it was it was it was uh, it was more difficult when she was living with us and controlling her access to the internet was hard because we used the internet you know yeah, in house, to yeah. make it 
available for us and not for her was always a struggle. But yeah. uh, in the two homes she's been in, there's been no access in the home to internet. And so uh, that, that's been easier to manage. Well, that's good. It sounds like you guys are doing just a fantastic job with her and with yourselves. Um, so what is what are your favorite self-care activities? <laughs> self-care activities. Well, I remember when we, when Rachel was in her some of her bad stuff when she was still with us. Um, we su- subscribed to Netflix. We'd never done that, and that we could watch some maybe sometime only twenty minutes at a time. But uh, that was very helpful for us. And, but we've always had a pretty good support system. You need that. Um, Sometimes Rachel would be in one of her really angry, uh, violent moods toward, she, she never, Rachel was never violent toward us as Cynthia was, but she, uh, toward property she was, she would destroy, throw things and break them and so forth. But if uh, uh, one time her art teacher happened to come, that calmed her down immediately. One time her older sister came. and So it helps to have a support group out there. But we enjoy going to, of course, it's been interrupted by COVID, but we enjoy concerts, uh, classical music, plays. Uh, and uh, I, for uh, several years, we both sang in choral groups. And that was certainly a, a, a good outlet. Mm-hmm. And we both continued to do some writing yeah. as we're able to provide the time. Right. Well, good. And writing, I, you know, I think writing is a great outlet for people, um, for caregivers. And like you mentioned before, Laquita, uh, journal, journaling. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, writing, keeping, keeping a log of what you're doing on. I'm actually a big fan of the gratitude journals right now where it's like, give me five things I can be thankful for. Oh, that's, uh-huh. that's good. Yeah, that's- yeah. I'm a huge fan of, I got one. I actually got one from Walmart. It was like $12, but they even have, um, for listeners who don't have the $12 because times are tough. There are journaling prompts on like Pinterest or on the interest that, or on the internet that you can find like your own journaling prompt and just, you know, get a, get a regular notebook and five things I'm happy for, or five things I'm grateful for today, five things that made me laugh, you know, one thing that I'm proud of. And um, those, those little, because I'm not a writer. I'm just, I'm not, I don't, I don't have the literature, the writing background or education. So to me, sometimes those prompts get my brain thinking about five things. I have to think of five things that made me feel good. And then I usually take a minute and I can, but it's nice to reflect on your day or your week or whatever you have time for. So, um, Uh, I like that, uh, uh, journal of uh, gratitude. (laughs) It is, it's, uh, very difficult to be thankful and angry at the same time. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Well, exactly. And that's why, and that's why I, I do that. It, it's really helped. Honestly, that's been one of like the biggest mental health tips is is that gratitude journal just just trying to get your brain positive it's it's no you know it's no substitute for you know therapy and help like actual help but it's a great supplement to it and it's Mm -hmm. something that's very easy and affordable to obtain um but i i did want to mention that as a self-care because even if you're not doing the gratitude and you're just logging your week that's still journaling and reflection and looking back and um I just want to make sure that I added that because I felt yeah. like that was super important, if that's okay. Uh, it is. Well, what, uh, we also took advantage of Rachel wanting to lie in bed and not get up uh, early. And so we uh, would get up early ourselves and have that time to read our Bible t- together or whatever, a uh, devotional journal or something, and just get your mind fixed for the day. So we that that was always very helpful. Yeah, and I think that that's great too. Um, you know, any self care you can squeeze in when you're a caregiver is so important, yeah, and it's right. always a step above your basic needs. Self care is not just to reiterate; it's not eating, showering, 
or going to the bathroom. Those are your basic needs. We got to go up a little bit. Um, You know, I I think we can both agree on that. Just just surviving and thriving are two different things. Yeah. That self-care focus is important. So my last question for you guys, where can my audience find you and your books? Both of our books uh, are available on Amazon. Uh, I think uh, they're now selling for $8 a copy. I'm not sure. I think that's right. And paperback. Or you can get an e you can, Yeah, you can get an e-book for, I think, only a dollar or two. So if you want to read that way, well, it's available in both mediums. So that's the the easy, the quickest and easiest. Just go through Amazon. Okay, great. And do you guys have a website? We do. We do, but we I've don't. Never yeah, we <laughs> we have. I'm afraid we haven't been diligent in maintaining. <laughs> okay, um, that's okay. And just and just. Uh, okay. if, but but if anybody wants it, it's simple. Higgsbooks.com. Oh, we're not much self promoters, I'm afraid, but. <laughs> That's that's okay. And again, the title of your book is Shattered Dreams But Hope, Encouragement for Caregivers of Huntington's, of Huntington's Disease and Other Progressive Illnesses. So I want to thank you guys both so much for coming on. Thank you both for your time. Um, your story was very, you know, it was encouraging and inspiring. And um, there were just a lot of relatable moments. And I just thank you guys again both of you for just sharing your story putting it out there and coming on caregiver chronicles well thank you and, and god bless you and your continued activities too yes thank you and with that i um that will wrap up this week's episode of caregiver chronicles if you have any questions concerns or comments about this episode you can reach out to me at caregiver chronicles pod at gmail.com you can find me on instagram caregiver chronicles 2 facebook caregiver chronicles twitter caregiver chron 1 um, I'm also on TikTok as Sarah Stell McBrow, um, where you can hear things of what's up to date with Caregiver Chronicles. We we also would love it if you would share this episode with a friend, if you have a friend who needs to hear this, or if you would also be willing to give us a thumbs up, a like, a rating, or a review, we would appreciate that as well. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week.